Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I will present our activities and along with that, the, the methodologies and the rationale for choosing those methodologies for the development of a silicon carbide inverter for electric traction drive. So first of all, I'd like to acknowledge the contribution of my colleagues here. Uh, uh, we work as a team, and the team includes other faculty advisors, Dr. Doug Hopkins and Dr. Monsoon Yu, who is also here uh, next to me. Uh, participating in this presentation, as well as uh, our researchers, the graduate students, uh, without which we cannot approach this work, and then include Adam Morgan, Adam Stevens, Google, from uh, the uh, Round of Christian Murphy, Riga, and Young Shu. Going to the next page. Um, so the project objectives and the approach at the beginning. So in the in the first year of the project, we were tasked to develop a 55 kilowatt silicon carbide inverter. And uh, in the in the second year, we are um, enhancing that into a 100 kilowatt inverter. So what I will present today is the like I said the methodology. And the objective is primarily to develop the EV inverter. In the first year, we 20% reduced size and weight based on 13.5 liters of volume and 11 kilograms uh, uh, for the 60, uh, 55 kilowatt inverter, and then have a target efficiency of 98%, uh, which I'll show we have achieved. And in the budget period two, we are targeting a 99% system efficiency. Basically, the overall goal is to establish the viability of uh, using uh, wide bandgap devices in EV traction applications and uh, do it in an open source manner so that the technology can be offered to institute partners and instrumentals. And this could be uh, a viable starting point for commercialization of the, of the product line. So uh, essentially, so it's a multi-physics based design. So some of the approaches that we have uh, taken. So it's uh, computational fluid dynamics, circuit analysis, uh, electromagnetic analysis, all incorporated first to simulation uh, before arriving at the design. And some of the other key features are that, like we have used distributed caps and a PCB based bus, bus bar. Uh, a parallel project also developed a uh, power chip on bus module where the mainstream project was using everything commercial of the available of the shelf. We also have some innovations in the in, use innovative approaches for the 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 full plate design and then uh, uh, innovations in the optimized gate driver design and then the overall integration uh, to deliver performance uh, as well as the protection. So it's a stack uh, architecture, a planner architecture. Uh, that has been adopted uh, and shown here in, the, in this slide here. So the upper figure shows the different pieces of the of the inverter, but the bottom one shows the integrated module. So as you can see on a planner uh, and stack, uh, vertically stacked architecture, which was essential to achieve the very high power density that we needed for this uh, for this development. And it, it integrates all of the electrical, mechanical, and thermal subsystems. So all of these have to be considered when we are designing uh, these kind of products that have to, to serve the purpose in its application. So after an extensive like initial evaluation of what parts are available, and then followed by circuit simulation analysis, we, we chose to use the six-pack silicon carbide power device module uh, from Wolfspeed, which you can see in the middle layer here. So, so, so that's the silicon carbide module. Uh, and then we also use the interleaving technique for the boost inductors. Uh, it's a two-stage design. So initially, the, the, the battery voltage is boosted up to a higher voltage level, and then the inverter comes next. So the interleaving technique is used for performance improvement, and the inductors are at the bottom of the cold plate, but the cold plate sits in the middle. The distributed gas, the black one that you can see on the outside, and then the, the PCB-based bus bar is over here, and on top of that is the 
is the gate driver circuitry. So uh, the current sensors for the three phases are shown coming out over here. So very tight integration, which was essential to achieve the kind of power density that we wanted to, that we, we targeted for. And then also uh, reducing the overall loop capacitances, which is essential. So in the automotive industry, we're targeting to loop inductances of um, like 10 nanometers or lower. And, and, and that was the goal uh, for this overall integration. So the circuit topology is, is shown over here. So initially, like uh, different uh, configurations were studied to um, to see what is the most suitable one. And the four key modules I mentioned earlier, three of those modules are used uh, used for the inverter stage and the refueling stage. And then you have the front end boost state. So the battery boost is boosted to these inductors, which are being used in the interleaf fashion. Um, and then the boosted inverter stage to provide um, the power to the motor drive. Um, and all of these modules are the same. So the advantages of a little bit about the, why we chose the, the boosted technology. Most of the industries uh, use non-boosted. But many industries like Toyota, they use the boosted version, and some of the four also use the boosted version. So the advantages of the boost version is you can have a lower battery voltage, which you can uh, boost to a higher detailing voltage over here. And if you can manage the, the current ripples, then the detailing capacitor requirements will go down, which is a tremendous advantage. And the DC link capacitor is one of the most major expensive components in the inverter design. And the more we can minimize that, and, and the better it is for overall power density as well as reliability also. So uh, this gives us the higher DC link voltage. The boost state can be switched at a much higher frequency compared to the inverter state. And that's another advantage. Um, and, and then um, the control also. Uh, you can also improve the performance through innovations in control. For example, you can have a variable DC link voltage depending on the operating mode of the vehicle. So that gives us control flexibility when you have this two-stage conversion. And the battery doesn't need to be at a very high voltage level. So from the battery point of view, that's also better. So, so, so the first is commercially off-the-shelf uh, module. So what we did is like we are using this silicon carbide TR Wolf T6 spec module, and the first step was to complete a uh, parameter extraction. So that was done in a non-destructive way using the HESI mechatronics uh, uh, ribbon bonder and the digital camera system. And so physical measurement, we evaluated the, 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 all of the circuit parameters, which we later used in the circuit simulation model. So the ANSYS Q3D model of the uh, software was used to simulate the current density and also to calculate the major uh, current loop inductance. So in parallel, we had another project uh, going on to see what we can make internally. Um, for double-sided cooling. So we know that like uh, this is not possible in one year to build the, the module and then do system integration as well. So what we did is like uh, we tried to have to develop a power chip and bus module which will give us a single switch uh, using uh, at, at the rating of like 1200 volts at 100 amps. Um, so to evaluate how much uh, what is the power density that can be used to custom design the module? And maybe this will give us the possibility of completely going into an air cooled inverter system. So the module is designed uh, using two um, silicon covered MOSFETs, each at 100, uh, 1200 volts, kilovolts, uh, sorry, 1200 volts and 50 amps, and one silicon covered shrunk diodes, 1200 volts and 50 amps. The module dimension, as you can see here, is uh, 41 by 41 times 42 millimeter cube and weighs uh, 62 kilograms. And as I 
didn't put the results here, but in terms of performance, the, the loop inductances are significantly smaller with this module compared to the key module. The power loop inductance for the key module was extracted to be 35 nanohenry, whereas for this one it's 8 nanohenry, and the gate loop inductance was 25 nanohenry for the key module, uh, <coughs> six-step module, I mean, and for this one it was only like four. <coughs> So this shows the process that was uh, followed uh, for the development of this power chip and bus module. So the top side metallization process is necessary for the customized exadite and top side aluminum. And all the industry compatible processes were developed using our on campus uh, clean room facility and uh, the, the e beam deposition of the metal, uh, which is nickel and silver, for 10 nanometers and 1,000 nanometers is achieved with good reliability. And that's what we demonstrated um, building this hard chip and power chip. So let me go back into the system level design again. So here uh, we have evaluated like two gate driver ICs. In the first stage, we were uh, evaluating the Infineon IED uh, 2.0 I12. Uh, this is an older generation design that uses uh, uh, magnetically isolated drivers and uh, with a 50 kilovolt per microsecond at, 15, at five, 500 volts uh, for the common mode of transit immunity. So this was originally designed for silicon devices and not really suitable for silicon carbide. So, so we quickly went into this, uh, the newer devices that were available from PI that provided the, the capacitively isolated driver stages with 100 kilovolts uh, per microsecond and at 1500 volts common nodes transient immunity, and this delivered like much better results uh, for the silicon carbide devices. So this shows the gate driver. Uh, the four modules uh, uh, would be sitting right underneath these uh, gate driver modules, and then the, the, we just shown blocked off by these uh, four rectangular red squares that you see over here. The first one is for the boost stage the gate driver for the six feet on the boot stage and subsequent three ones are for the inverter stages. And it's a very ultra low profile design is what we targeted for. Uh, the the very hard supply offers a 500 kilohertz and it gives uh, 100 kilovolts per microseconds DVDT immunity. And it is suitable for a wide frequency range up to 200 kilohertz and also wide temperature range. So the advantages, this slide was showing the advantages of going uh, for the interleaving technique. So the simulation results here shows the differences between the non-interleaved version on the left and the interleaved version on the right. So the major benefit is, of course, the, the, the desilin current reduction, which helps reducing the sizes of the capacitors as well. So compared to the uh, so the PS2010 boost inductor, the inductor stage has an overall 56% volume reduction, 51% weight reduction, and more importantly, 48% uh, loss reduction, which helps us achieve the high efficiency that we can get from these modules. We also use a customized uh, 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 it's a customized whole uh, plate design for double-sided cooling. So essentially, that the dance-floor shower power technique was used here. Uh, so for uniform distribution uh, and flow through of the coolant, uh, and from for both the devices on one side as well as the inductors on the other side. If you recall, as I shown earlier, uh, the cold plate is, is is in the middle. Uh, between the devices on one side and the inductors on, on, on the other side, and this helped us achieve uh, much better uh, thermal performance. So this shows the overall 
uh, design of the package 55 kilowatt inverter. And uh, one thing I did mention here, the inductors also were bought it with large, uh, with large provided supplied uh, encapsulants for better thermal management, and that also helps us reduce the uh, reduce the power losses and a more even distribution of the heat. Um, so reduce the operating temperature means lower I squared R losses also. So these all help us achieve higher efficiency. So this is some of the experimental results obtained for this system here. Um, on the left is the drain to source voltage waveforms of, of each individual devices. And as you can see here, like these are really clean with less than 3% um, spikes, uh, voltage spikes of the DC link voltages. And the, the switching frequencies for the boost stage was 70 kilohertz, as well as uh, but for the inverter stage, it was only 35 kilohertz, which is about five times more than what is currently used in with silicon inverters in traction applications. And, and this helped us like a five, uh, five times reduction in the ripple of the currents. As you can see, the currents are here on the right hand side are very clean. And uh, which was achieved with five times increase of the switching frequency compared to the silicon IGBT solution. So here is showing some of the thermal images. Um, the temperature distribution, as you can see, is very even. Um, and uh, the potted inductors are underneath, where the the, um, the PCB and the and the driver stage um, circuits are all well within the the stress the thermal stress limits of the circuit. So here's some more uh, efficiency evaluation results here. Uh, the the system efficiency for the dual stage, including the boost and, and the inverter, was measured to be 99%. Um, each one of the individual um, efficiencies were 98.5%. Um, so the overall efficiency that we've shown here has a is 99, uh, sorry, uh, let me repeat this. The targeted efficiency was 98%, but we had uh, already achieved 99% in the first year. So this shows that we should be able to achieve the 99% efficiency target for the 100 kilowatt inverter, which is more targeted for uh, pure battery electric vehicles, whereas the 55 kilowatt inverter is more targeted for like the hybrid electric type vehicles. So some of the cost bed breakdowns that shown over here. Uh, as you can see, the major component is still the silicon carbide power module, and that's where the different partners of the institute has to come together to work on reducing the silicon carbide power module cost, which will make the adoption of these technologies in different applications much more attractive. So this is show the achieved power density here of 12.1 uh, kilowatt per liter with the designed inverter, two-stage inverter for 55 kilowatts. Uh, and it is well uh, within the reach of the DOE 2020 goals of 13.4 kilowatts per liter. And it is much better than the, the 2010 uh, Toyota PS start generation. Uh, inverters. So I'll go very quickly over the targets for the next uh, next year. Uh, what we had not achieved previously is did address the EMI issues in the first year, and that's one of our major goals to address in the second year of the project. And also in boost to the power level to 100 kilowatts and also achieve 99% uh, uh, overall system level efficiency. So very quickly, uh, what we are uh, going to in the first three months of this, uh, of this project is how to incorporate the soft switching techniques. And the, the benefits of that, of course, will be improved efficiency. But it will, when we apply the DBA zero voltage switching, it will also have an impact on the reduction of the DVDT, the reduction of the EMI, 
and the reduction of the parasitic uh, ring. So ZBS implementation is the is the first goal, and some of the results from analysis and calculations are shown over here. That for the non-interleaved uh, zero voltage switching, we could achieve a total device power loss of 470 watts, but with interleaved zero voltage switching, we can achieve uh, 428 watt of losses, and that's our goal. Um, that's our design goal this year, that we will have interleaving with zero voltage switching. Uh, for the lack of time, I'll go very quickly over this. So we are also setting up the, how do we evaluate this and how do we measure this? So talking with the, the automotive industry partners, we have come up with the, uh, the test setup that we will need for the EMI measurement. And the SIS per 25 is what has been recommended, and that's what we will use for for the EMI testing. And for that purpose, we have already uh, ordered the components, the listen devices, and the spectrum analyzer, with the help of which we will be able to to conduct some of these EMI testing. And and then, like the effects of the EMI is not only on the inverter stages, but it affects the motors as well because the these high spikes because of the, the very high switching frequencies on the DVDTs, the common mode voltages also affect the motors the, because of the capacitance between the motor shaft and the frame, and also between the stator frame and the shaft. So all of these get affected. So there is an incentive to. Uh, to address the EMI. And then like three approaches are being taken here. One is to to, to spread the energy spectrum of the EMI. Uh, the second is improved modulation techniques. And the third one is active gate rising. So with all of these three approaches, we should be able to achieve the EMI reduction as a very lucrative alternatives to using a bulk, bulk capacitive EMI filter. So, so that's our approach for this year. So the work has, is, is being, has already been reported and published and some of the other uh, publications are coming up in the ECCE conference, which I would, uh, if you want to get into more details of these uh, activities, you're welcome to, to look into these publications. So with that, I will conclude my talk. And if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. Thank you very much, Dr. Hussain. I would ask you if you have any questions, you use the uh, chat function in uh, WebEx. There is a collection that you have to submit uh, any dialogue through the chat window. And if you will submit your questions through the chat window, I'll read the questions so everyone hears them clearly. And uh, then Dr. Hussain I will answer the questions. Any questions from here in the room? Uh, hi, this is Pablo. I had a question about the ZVS range. Uh, um, so typically, uh, ZVS is easy to obtain at the, at, in the partial range. Um, however, it's difficult to, to do it over all uh, operating conditions. Uh, so how difficult will be uh, with your converter? Yeah, you're you're right. Like the, for light load conditions, for uh, especially the, achieving the GVS is is the most uh, difficult one. So uh, we haven't uh, we don't have the solution yet for the entire range, but we are going to some. Uh, control techniques and simulation analysis to achieve the GVS for the entire range. Right. Do you have some additional comments on that? Yes. For PCDC bidirectional converter, we will reach soft switching from zero load to full load at uh, any load and any power level. That means the maximum power level. By Special frequency control and the modulation control. Okay, thank you. Uh, the first question that someone sent in is uh, What is the temperature of the cooling fluid used in the design? So, uh, 
So it's 65 C inlet temperature. Um, okay. Uh, what is the best power density achieved to date? Hmm. Uh, with our design, it's 12 and 1 kilowatts per liter, and I, that's the best I've seen so far. Right? Yes, for some uh, next generation EV drive, they also use the double side cooling for silicon IDBT. The power density also can reach a similar results. Mm -hmm. But now we use the commercial available silicon carbon devices. The efficiency is much higher, and the power density now is, can be further improved. Yeah, the solution that I had uh, presented, like with double-sided cooling and power chip and bus module, uh, if we are to further develop that into the system level, so that would give us even better power density. Okay. What is the power density without the boost converter? Mm -hmm. We didn't calculate that because all of it is like a, the total mass was calculated including the boost inductor. So just for the inverter state here, I mean, I don't have a fixed number for that. Yeah, 40% improvement. 40%. 40%. Without the boost state. Okay. Next question. Uh, I think it says uh, you showed efficiencies up to 15 watts, not the full 55 kilowatts. What is the efficiency of the target 55 kilowatts? So we didn't mention that. It couldn't mention that due to the lack of uh, equipment. Uh, and we are like uh, trying to set up the dyno where we can measure that. But like uh, in the lab, without the dyno, it's not possible for us to do to uh, uh, to measure the efficiency up to 50, 55 kilowatts. But the 55 kilowatt is the uh, peak rating, 30 kilowatt is the continuous rating, and we did, we did measure efficiencies at up to 30 kilowatt level. And that was the 98% that you reported? Uh, yeah, 98.5%. Okay. Are you considering the use of coupled inductors to reduce the magnetic losses? Oh, well, we didn't consider that yet, but this could be an option, right? Okay, next question is, how much bus capacitance are you using? So the capacitance was two, 150 microfarads? Yeah, 150 microfarads. Okay, could you go back to the power switch slide on the metallization? All right. Which one is that? Go back. Way back, way back. Two, two. On slide number seven. Eight. Okay, this one. That one. Yeah. What is the power delta? Okay, you should be just okay. Let me see if there is a question related to that. If they just wanted to see this. All right. There are two slides on this. This one and the previous one. And discuss what yeah, area yeah. for metalized why. We'll discuss what areas were metallized and why, I guess, is the question. So the top side definitely for dye attachment. Um, uh, or solderable. But yeah, yeah. For solderable dye attachment. The top side was metallized. Then that answer the question? Yeah. Uh, what kind of, and then on the top side of the uh, top side metallization, what was that connection? Point. How is that uh, inter next connection point being made? Is it soldered or sintered or? You can see the film mask. That's the layout for the area. Then later you can see the right button. That one for okay. the, the soldering test. I see. Okay, so for soldering. I see. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Next question is, there is a push to run off 105P cooling fluid on vehicles to eliminate the 65 to 70 to 3T cooling loop. Could you run at this temperature? And if not, what is your resulting max output power and power density? 
we cannot do this one of course because all of the analysis and the, the, the simulations were done for 65 degree heat cooling. Uh, so the push, I'm not sure like how much that is from the automotive industry because I hear the automotive industry wants to keep the coolant loop for the engine and the power electronics and the motor separate. Maybe for uh, some industrial off-road, there's more of a push to go for 105C cooling for their vehicle. But uh, this one we cannot, and this wasn't optimized for 105C cooling. Okay, I think this will be our last question then, so we can uh, go to Dr. Lukic. Uh, since your steady state power is 30 kilowatts, does your power density number use this? or the peak 55 kW, should it not be the steady state rating? So we use the peak for this one, and that's how, you know, it's been reported for the DOE targets and all of that. It's the peak rating that is considered for the power density numbers. Okay, I think we have time for one more. This next one is, last one is related to cost. You showed the cost breakdown, but can you say what the delta is for a comparable silicon inverter? So I, I don't have it up and here, but it will basically essentially be the difference in the cost of the power module. So the power module is the is the is the most expensive component here, having like eighty five percent of the total cost. And that's what needs to be replaced for the silicon cost. <clears throat> but of course, like the other things will also change, right? Because the, the switching frequencies and other, uh, the numbers will change and that will cause an increase in the capacitors and other package components, sizes and, and costs as well. So, but those cost deltas are minimal compared to the cost delta for the device. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Hussein. Okay, thank you all. Our next uh, speaker today is